Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today. Um, we are here as part of our Giving Tuesday series, where we are encouraging, encouraging everyone to get involved, get outside and give to gear up for Giving Tuesday, which is December 1st. Um, so this is our second to last event. They've been so great so far, and we're excited to hear today um, from Victoria. Uh, I guess I should say, hi, I'm Katie Hobgood, <laughs> I'm the program director at Save the Dunes. Um, and today we are talking about um, butterflies, which for Victoria, that's one of her favorite ways to get involved is to share her love and excitement of butterflies and all things pollinators, but particularly butterflies. Um, so we are going to uh, get some great information today. I'm really looking forward to hearing all of the, the facts and uh, info she's going to be sharing. Um, please feel free to post your questions in the comment section on this video and uh, we'll uh, address those at the end. So without further ado, we have Victoria Wittig, our senior program specialist, and take it away. Thank you, Katie. And Thank you um, to everyone who's tuning in, whether you're watching live or looking at this later, I am absolutely delighted to have an opportunity to share with you why I give. Um, you know, biodiversity is something that matters to me. And in particular, I love the diversity of butterflies that are found throughout our region. And I'm looking over here at a box of some of these beautiful butterflies. So what you're seeing here is a collection of mainly swallowtails. Um, these are all native butterflies that are found um, in Illinois, Indiana, uh, many other places, but they could be found in your own backyard. We see some of the um, most beautiful individuals in the landscape, including um, the tiger swallowtail, the spice bush swallowtail over here, the monarch, Maybe you've seen a viceroy, a zebra swallowtail. Um, all of these butterflies really thrive in a landscape rich in native plants. And I'm, I'll be sharing um, some more of my boxes, but I did wanna say that that's a, um, a lifelong collection from somebody from a long time ago. I never recommend that anybody collect specimens. Um, you know, pictures, speak a thousand words, but this educational um, set that I have, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to share it with you, but please don't go and collect butterflies. That's old news. So anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the presentation um, that I've prepared for you today. And so Katie, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to wait for technology to catch up with what's going on. Let's move that out of the way and let's see here. So I always like to start out in my presentations by just taking a look at our planet, planet Earth. It's so beautiful. It is one of the most incredible places in the universe largely because it has so much biodiversity. Biodiversity is the variety of species and ecosystems in a given area. And my presentation is deciding that it wants to advance slides when I'm not ready. So I'm just gonna work with what we have here. Um, so back to planet Earth, it's rich in biodiversity and probably invokes in a lot of people a lot of different reactions. And for me, it's the biodiversity, the variety of species and ecosystems in a given area, a given geographic area. When I lectured at a university, I was often talking about, um, you know, the technical aspects of biodiversity. But I think it's important for all of us to have an appreciation for what it actually means. There are three different levels of biodiversity. What you see here on this slide is the ecological diversity shown in the bigger picture here. And that's the variety of habitats, niches, or the jobs that species do, the different trophic levels, and the interactions that they have with one another. 
So ecological diversity is the largest level. Species diversity includes all of the different individuals in that landscape. So here you can see different species of birds, different species of reptiles, invertebrates, lots of different plants. And when we're thinking about species diversity, we're thinking about the variety of those species in the landscape. So how many different types of species there are, but also how many of each of them there are. So how many of these blue birds, yellow birds, et cetera, that tells us something about the health of the landscape. On another level is genetic diversity. So within any one of those species that reproduces sexually, there'll be genetic variations. So here in this graphic, we see red butterflies and they're all slightly different. And that's because each and every one of them is unique in the entire universe. So biodiversity is something incredibly important to the health and integrity of life on the planet because biodiversity underpins the ecosystem services that make life on earth possible. Now ecosystem services are those functions of natural systems that provide value to all of us free of charge. The services include supporting services, provisioning services, regulating services, and cultural services. Biodiversity falls in the supporting category. Pollination, which we're going to talk about with, you know, content on the butterflies, is a provisioning service. So sometimes I ask people if they've ever paid a bee for the food that they're eating. Well, you don't necessarily have to pay a bee with money, but you could certainly pay a bee with native flowers that give it the nectar and pollen it needs to thrive. Now, a little bit of a serious note here, um, you know, tragically and unfortunately, biodiversity is in decline all around the world. This is a very data rich slide and I don't want to dive too much into the detail, but I would encourage anyone who's interested in learning more to check out the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It's a body run by the United Nations and it gathers together scientists from all around the world to look at what is causing the decline in biodiversity. And I'll bring your attention to the terrestri terrestrial environment shown here and the direct drivers of biodiversity decline. This dark purple square indicates that land use change is the largest driver of declines. This is followed by direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, invasive species, and other drivers. It's alarming to think that approximately 25% of species on the planet are already threatened with extinction. It's tragic. It's also becoming clear that our insects are in particular trouble. In this feature from the New York Times, they presented an argument that perhaps the insect apocalypse is here. Really? My goodness, well, what would that mean for the rest of life on Earth? Is it possible that we could survive without our insects? What do they do for us? What are the services they provide? Is there anything we can do to help them? Well, I hope your wheels are turning. Mine certainly were when I read that piece. But when we think about what's happening on the landscape, it's really not difficult to understand that, yeah, biodiversity is in trouble. Prior to settlement in Indiana specifically, the landscape was covered in forest in the majority of the state. This is a diverse state, and I'll get to the uh, Northwest Indiana region in a moment. But just so you can gain an appreciation for how we got to where we are today, we used to have a lot more native land cover. Over time, we've cleared that native land, the forests, the prairies, the wetlands, mainly for agriculture, also for development, and in Northwest Indiana industry. And so even though this is an older 
um, image of Indiana from 2001, it's a pretty accurate description of what the landscape has transformed into. Now, when we think about forests and, and other ecosystems, perhaps we're not thinking about the world right outside our doorstep. This is a common image, <clears throat> pardon me, across America, a lawn, a lawn. There's nothing else there. It's monoculture grass. All of that rich diversity that the planet supports is not found here. So just taking a moment to appreciate, you know, the change in land use that we have put on the planet is also putting a lot of stress on all the animals that thrive here. Now, when we think about agriculture, my goodness, Often we're looking at monocultures like these corn rows here. And so again, there's none of that rich biodiversity. The ecosystems aren't present, the species aren't present, the genetic diversity isn't present. And so whenever I see a monoculture of anything, whether it's in my lawn or in an agricultural field, the alarm bells start to go off. I'm thinking about Northwest Indiana in particular, um, brings to mind diversity for me. This region is incredible in the amount of different types of ecosystems that it supports. Now, Northwest Indiana is the meeting point of ecosystems from the north, the south, the east, and the west. You know, sometimes they say that it's the crossroads of America. Well, it's the crossroads of ecosystems in America, too. Northwest Indiana is, in fact, one of the most biodiverse regions in the entire country. Here you'll find prairie, dune and swale, which reflect the historic shoreline of Lake Michigan, rivers, swamps, bogs and fens, marshes, savanna, forests, and our marvelous dunes, not to mention Lake Michigan. It's an incredibly special place. And so when we think about biodiversity and we think about Northwest Indiana, the two go hand in hand. This picture is pre-settlement vegetation. It's an illustration by one of my favorite local artists, Barb Labus. And it, show, it just goes to show that across this landscape, there's so much richness to, to behold. So at Save the Dunes, we work on a lot of different projects and we all wear many different hats. And one of them this past year has been leading an effort to do conservation action planning. We're doing this in focus areas across Northwest Indiana that represent the richness of the region's biodiversity. This includes ecosystems of the Indiana Dunes, the wonderful diversity found in Hobart Marsh, the heart of the Calumet where you can see the lovely dune and swale, wetlands along the west branch of the Little Calumet River, and also the east branch of the Little Calumet River, where we're putting in lots of kayak launches so you can get out on the water and enjoy what the river has to offer. Now this conservation action plan alignment is an effort by all of our conservation partners to identify what's important in those landscapes and how we can ensure that they thrive when these natural areas thrive, so does the biodiversity. Imagine all the different plants, flowers, available for our pollinators in these rich natural areas, these preserves that are adjacent to communities, that are adjacent to this rich region. In conservation action planning, the partners that work together identify the scope of the area that they're focused on, develop a vision for how they want that landscape to thrive. They identify conservation and human well being targets, threats to those targets, and strategies to overcome the threats so that the landscape does exactly what it's supposed to thrive. So along with conservation action planning, where we're all working together to figure out what we need to do in the landscape, we also work on on the ground restoration. 
This here is an image of the East Branch of Little Calumet River. And I've put stars on two locations in this landscape where we've been working on restoration in collaboration with Shirley Hines Land Trust, the Dunes Learning Center, NIPSCO, Save the Dunes. And we're supported by a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's Shy Cal Rivers Fund to do this good work. And so in the East Branch of Little Calumet River, of course, you have the river and the riparian forests along its banks. But in this project, we were able to enhance the J. Timothy Ritchie Nature Preserve owned and managed by Shirley Hines Land Trust. With funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Shirley Hines Land Trust was able to create and install a sign that not only identifies where you're at, you can rest here on the bench, clean your boots after walking on the trails to make sure you're not, or before walking on the trails to make sure you're not spreading um, any invasive seeds unintentionally. It also features a rich history of the site, the namesake, how you can identify and enjoy the trails. And if you have a mind to, in the springtime, J. Timothy Ritchie Nature Preserve is an explosion of spring wildflowers. These spring ephemerals are some of the first flowers in the landscape. And the pollinators that are emerging early in the season are sure to be found here. At any time of year, you can also enjoy the most incredible beech trees that I personally have ever seen. These beech trees are found throughout this forest on the banks of the East Branch. And we're so thrilled to have been able to help Shirley Hines Land Trust restore and enhance this beautiful place for all to enjoy. Now, looking back at the focus area, I put another star over here and that star indicates the Dunes Learning Center. Earlier this year, our colleague on the project, Jim Whiteneck, recorded a lovely video to celebrate Pollinator Week. And I wanted to share that with you now. So bear with me as I transfer to a different media and hand it over to Jim. Happy Pollinator Week. I'm Ranger Jim, and I'm at one of my favorite sites at the park, the Dunes Learning Center. Every year, thousands of kids come to this site to get their first National Park Service experience and learn about my favorite subject, environmental science. During Pollinary Week, we like to celebrate the five Bs. Not buffaloes, but butterflies, bats, birds, beetles, and bees. Today, we're going to explore some collaborative restoration work that's been going on around this special site to improve pollinator habitat. This restoration project began a few years ago. The land managers from Shirley Hines Land Trust, Nice Source, and the park sat down together with Santa Dunes to discuss similar interests and serving our young visitors here at the Dunes Learning Center. Three years ago, before restoration work began, the area looked very similar to this. Here, non-native invasive species like Oriental Bittersweet, Autumn model, Honeysuckle, took over. With no natural predators, invasive species can thrive and cause a lot of ecological damage, like this Canadian thistle here. This non-native invasive plant, if not treated, can now compete the native species in this restored prairie, throwing this ecosystem out of balance. Here's an example of some of the land clearing that had to be done to restore some of the native prairies and historical landscapes in the area. After clearing some of the land, treating the invasive species and reseeding, now we have native prairie that is awesome pollinator habitat. Pollinators sustain our many ecosystems here at the park by helping plants reproduce, like this beautiful milkweed that is growing right here on a restoration project that surrounds the Dunes Learning Center. And so here what you're looking at is a NIPSCO right-of-way um, and adjacent to it, the community of Beverly Shores installed a native garden where pollinators are sure to thrive. So this is just one example of what you can do in your community to enhance the natural areas in the park and at the Dunes Learning Center and on our nature preserves and really support the rich biodiversity that we all have. 
So let me try with a little finessing to <laughs> ask iMovie to stop sharing. Um, yeah, let's quit iMovie. We're done with it anyway. And hopefully it's gonna stop. There we go. And so I'm gonna stop sharing, um, come back to gallery view for a moment and um, circle back to something that Jim uh, mentioned in his wonderful video. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I've been waiting to share that for a long time. So this is a great opportunity, I'm so glad. Um, but Jim pointed out milkweed and at that point in the year, it was a uh, you know, luscious green plant where our monarch caterpillars might be found munching and crunching on the leaves. But later on in the year, that milkweed plant will produce pods and those pods eventually will produce seeds. And so I plant some milkweed in my garden to support the monarch butterfly. Um, also because when the flowers are in bloom, they sure do attract a lot of pollinators. But I also really, look forward to when I can harvest the seed pods. So I cut this from um, a butterfly weed yesterday and I just wanted to share with you guys, um, you know, how many seeds there are in this pod and that if you actually look, uh, the wind will disperse these seeds with the silk, just blows in the wind. So I wanted to um, take special note that if you're not in a place where you can have a lot of different wildflowers, like at Beverly Shores, you know, they've got a large area where it's okay for these seeds to disperse, then perhaps you want to go and cut your milkweed pods off after they've dried down and the, and the seeds are ready to go and maybe gift them to your friend or neighbor who's interested in starting their own native garden. And in that way, we can help these seeds find a good home. So for the next part of the presentation, I wanted to uh, move away from what we're doing in our natural areas to you know, preserve, protect, and restore them at Save the Dunes and think about what, what can we do at home? You know, we don't live in the parks. We don't live in the preserves. We live at home. And hopefully, watching this presentation, you're thinking about how you might be able to convert your lawn into something that is more rich and supportive of biodiversity. So I'm gonna jump into that section now. I'm gonna start sharing another presentation. And I regret that I pre-recorded this. And so I've got some timings that are probably locked in. And so I'm just gonna share um, this presenter view and hope that you can you can still see uh, the essential information. So here's the question. What if you could help save biodiversity with a garden? How does that work? Is the insect apocalypse here? What do the insects do? What do the pollinators do? How can you help? Well, let's start with some of the basics. Which of the following organisms are pollinators? The bees, the butterflies, the moths, the beetles, the flies, the birds, the bats? Well, if you were uh, following along, um, all of the above is the correct answer. All of these organisms, all of these insects, birds, bats, are pollinators. But what is it that they're doing? What is pollination specifically? Well, technically, you know, from a botanist perspective, it's the transfer of the sticky pollen on the male plant organ or the anther to the female plant organ, the stigma. And so these happy little bees are busy collecting the pollen from this flower. But while they're doing that, they're actually transferring pollen to the female plant organ and helping that plant fertilize to create the seeds for its next generation. So that's the completion of a plant's life cycle. Pollination is also an ecosystem service performed by the pollinators free of charge. So remember, you don't have to pay a bee with money, but you certainly could pay them with native flowers. Pollination is a necessary step for flowering plants to produce food, 
for humans and wildlife. So you may have heard that phrase, one of every three bites that you take is the result of pollination by one of our pollinators. And that's true in our agricultural fields, where we're growing grains, where we're growing fruits and orchards, all of that is taking place because of the work of pollinators. So all of the above is the correct answer. And there are lots of different pollinators to support. So the benefits, um, as I mentioned, are all of the above here. The benefits of pollination are biodiverse ecosystems, food from flowering plants in our agricultural fields. I forgot to mention also at home in our vegetable gardens. It provides the pollinators with the nectar they need to complete their life cycle and it enhances our life. That's that cultural ecosystem service benefit that we receive from the pollinators hard work. And boy, I wish that they weren't in trouble, but they are. Boy, there are so many threats to the pollinators. I mentioned land use change. And so the conversion of natural areas into agricultural fields, you know, um, rural and urban development industry. But pollinators are also faced with overcoming the challenges of climate change. And they don't have politics, they don't debate, they're just dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. The timing of plants emerging in the spring, whether or not those flowers are available when the pollinators emerge, it's an important thing to keep in mind. And so the more native plants that we can put in the landscape, the more that those pollinator populations will have an opportunity to complete their life cycle. I love to share this slide in particular when thinking about how to incorporate native plants into your landscape, because you know I'm talking mainly about what you can do at home, but perhaps you're also involved in your community, maybe at your local library, maybe you own a business in town, maybe you volunteer at your school. Well, those are all places where native plants have an opportunity to thrive. The Park Forest Public Library is one of my favorite places in the region. And one of the reasons why is because the library really celebrates native plantings. What you're seeing here is representative of the Illinois Prairie and the coneflowers are in full bloom. My goodness, this is the first thing that library patrons would see as they get out of their cars and start to walk toward the library, um, you know, to pursue whatever it is that they're going to do at the library that day. But you can also notice there's some butterfly weed in here. There's Joe Pye weed, um, several other species, and you can start to see the cone, uh, pardon me, the um, liatris, gay, gay flower, um, gay feather, pardon me, um, starting to bloom. Um, that plant looks like fireworks around the 4th of July um, when they're in full bloom. I took this picture in, in the same planting of a black swallowtail nectaring um, on that liatris. And so planting with native supports biodiversity, whether at home or in your community. And it also um, does something for our natural areas. Um, one of the um, most important conservation partners in the region is the Nature Conservancy. And Paul Labus has done so much good work with them over the years. And one of the quotes that I've heard him say, and I just love so much, is that we need to, quote unquote, soften the edges of our natural areas. So we can visit the, the national park, but what if the communities that are adjacent to the national park also incorporated some of the elements that we find in the park? For example, the native plants. That way the pollinators that are in the park will have some place to nectar, gather their pollen, complete their life cycles if they flutter outside the boundaries, which of course are artificial to the pollinators. The boundaries are really there just for us. Anyhow, when you're thinking about what kind of garden you might want to create, maybe you're planning, you're drawing, you're um, you know, figuring out what inspires you you can consult landscaping guides, you can consult your favorite gardening books, 
you can dream of a garden like this. I hope I have one day where it's just a work of art on the landscape. There's so many joys um, that gardening brings. You know, again, that's that cultural ecosystem service benefit that we have the power to create. The other great thing about incorporating native plants into the landscape is that they're adapted to be there. And so all of that effort, all of that money, all of those resources that you would put into fertilizer or pesticides or watering or mulching really aren't necessary in a native garden. Those plants will be able to complete their life cycle with the natural regimen of water over the course of the season. Um, you know, if your soil is healthy to start with, you don't really have to incorporate any of the fertilizers. Those plants are going to do just fine in the native type soils that we have. Pesticides, big no-no, especially if you want to attract pollinators. Pesticides are designed to kill. And we certainly don't want to do that to our pollinators. So it's really nice when you have your native plants in the landscape um, to know that you don't have to put pesticides down. Um, to control anything. So butterflies are one of my favorite um, insects, pollinators, species, creatures. They're just so wonderful for so many reasons. And, you know, thinking about their life cycle is something that I could just study for the end, until the end of time. What I want you to know is that to support butterflies in your landscape, you need to incorporate two different categories of plants. The host plants are the food plants for the baby caterpillars who can be extremely picky. The monarch is a pretty good example of that. The nectar plants are the flowers that provide the adult butterflies with a source of energy, but they also provide the source of energy for all the other pollinators. So the different types of butterflies that are out there may have specific host plants. They may prefer different types of nectar plants. And there's so many opportunities with all the diversity of butterflies out there to have a lot of diversity of flowers in your garden. And when we think about planet Earth, that sounds absolutely on the mark. Monocultures don't provide any of that. And if you're at the library, maybe you want to check out The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle, one of my favorite books ever, but I digress. A monoculture lawn is going to result in very, very hungry caterpillars. The monarch caterpillar in particular needs those delicious milkweed leaves. Um, and here you can see a couple of monarch caterpillars really going to town, munching and crunching on that leaf. So if there aren't any monarch leaves in your lawn, boy, these guys are gonna be in trouble. You know, the monarch butterfly, the adult will search and search for those milkweed plants to lay their eggs. And the caterpillar hatches out of that egg directly onto the leaf that it needs to eat. And if you're interested in raising monarchs um, and helping to you know, support them in the landscape, you be able to witness an incredible transformation as they hang upside down in this cool J form and then shed their final skin, turning into a chrysalis. A couple weeks later, they emerge as butterflies and will then be able to fly around, find the nectar in the flowers in your garden, I hope and, and uh, complete that cycle again. And so, yeah, you can save the monarch butterfly with milkweed and it is in trouble and it, it does need your help. Um, there are so many different milkweeds that you can incorporate in your garden. Um, the common milkweed is maybe the most well-known and it does um, create lots and lots of seeds. So make sure that when you plant your milkweed, it's in a spot where you want it to spread. Otherwise, be ready to clip those um, seed pods and, you know, hand them off to somebody else that wants to start growing um, a native garden. But for the monarch, you know, their caterpillars are only going to eat the milkweed leaves, but there's lots of different species 
of milkweed. So remember that level of, of biodiversity. Here it's represented by the milkweed. In fact, milkweed is found throughout the continental United States, into Canada, and into Mexico, which is really good news because this monarch does its migration all the way from Canada to Mexico um, with the support of these milkweeds. But look, you can have swamp milkweed, has a really lovely pink uh, flowers, prairie milkweed, if you've got a drier area with lots of sun, purple milkweed, which has stunning flowers, um, and lots of others, if you wanted um, to incorporate them, you can, you can do that too. And so um, here's a picture of a monarch nectaring on a common milkweed flower. Here's a picture of a young person on a nature walk learning to identify that milkweed, looking for eggs on the leaves and, and starting to connect with the natural world around them. It's so much fun to get started at an early age. I hope um, lots of you are able to enjoy those opportunities in your community too. But again, um, there is you know, a note of sadness in all of this. What you're seeing here is the Carner Blue Butterfly who um, has caterpillars that eat lupin, which is a native plant found in our savanna, dune and swale ecosystems in Northwest Indiana. And unfortunately, um, this is a sad tale because the Carner Blue is locally extinct. There was an incident a couple of years ago where um, the flowers were not available for the carners when they hatched. The plants weren't, weren't available. And later on in the year, there was a, a big drought. And so the second generation was unable to find the food that they needed when the caterpillars emerged. And those two things taken together, um, likely caused by climate change, um, caused the populations um, to be lost. So we really do have a lot of work to do um, when it comes to supporting our, our biodiversity in the region, but you can help. Um, the Baltimore checker spot is uh, one of the most beautiful butterflies in the region and its caterpillars eat white turtle head. You can find this plant um, at our native uh, plant sales and really like some wet um, ground. So if you've got an area in your garden that doesn't drain very well, this, this is a good option. Some of my conservation partners um, would say this one is really tricky to grow. And so if you don't really have a green thumb, maybe this isn't the plant that you want to bring into your landscape. Um, but maybe violets are. Violets, um, some people look at as weeds when they sprout up in, in a lawn. Remember that monoculture lawn? In fact, the violets are the food plant for the fritillaries. Here's a great spangled fritillary and there's all different um, species of fritillaries out in, in the region. And they are going to thrive in a lawn, quote unquote, that has lots of violets sprouting around. So I personally would love to have my entire lawn full of violets. Um, I'm working on that. I'm just not quite there, but you know, gardening is a work in progress. Um, the violets, of course, um, bloom earlier in the season. Um, asters, on the other hand, are one of those late blooming flowers um, that explode on the landscape in the fall. And this brings to mind another point um, where incorporating flowers that bloom at different times of the year is pretty important for the pollinators because um, pollinator season or butterfly season um, begins in early spring and ends in late fall. And so having um, flowers in your landscape that bloom at different times of the year is really great to support lots and lots of butterflies. Uh, Golden Alexander is one of the host plants for the black swallowtail. Again, here you see that uh, beautiful black swallowtail on um, nectaring on Liatris, but its caterpillars are going to need the leaves of um, the golden Alexander or, you know, any other plant in the carrot family. And so if you do have like a vegetable garden or you like to incorporate herbs, you are in luck because this caterpillar will eat parsley, 
dill and fennel. Um, in my garden, I always plant enough for me and the black swallowtails, I encourage you to do the same. And maybe um, in your landscape, you have space for flowers, native flowers, but maybe you also are thinking about putting in some shrubbery, some small trees, some big trees. And here again, you have an opportunity to support those pollinators. Here's a spice bush swallowtail nectaring on Joe pie weed. Here's its caterpillar, which needs to eat the leaves of the spice bush. Here's a picture I nabbed from the Missouri Botanical Garden that shows um, the growth form of this small tree or shrub. And um, when it blooms, you'll have these lovely yellow flowers. So a, a nice point of interest in your, in your landscape. And this blooms earlier in the year. Again, incorporating that seasonality into your native garden will help pollinators thrive um, year round. In the fall, imagine if you had a sassafras. Sassafras is also a host plant for the spice bush swallowtails caterpillars. And um, in the fall, it turns this wonderful, um, you know, kaleidoscope of colors, reds, oranges, yellows, um, along with the green. So this is one of my favorite plants um, to put in the landscape. Uh, but let's not forget some of the others. Pawpaw is a small growing tree um, native to the region. Um, it's also um, a prolific producer of fruit, um, sometimes called the Indiana banana. Um, I'm told I, I personally haven't eaten uh, pawpaw fruit because, well, there aren't any in my yard and I don't know where to find them <laughs> off the trail in our natural areas. Um, but anyhow, this is a lovely plant um, that supports the caterpillar of the zebra swallowtail. Such an incredibly beautiful butterfly you see here nectaring on um, black eyed Susans. And so um, there are lots of options for small trees and shrubs, but if you've got room on your property and a love for trees, well, you are in luck once again. Um, here's a tulip tree with this wonderfully straight growing trunk um, high up in the canopy. The tiger swallowtail, you see nectaring here on Joe Pieweed again, will lay its eggs on the leaves so that its caterpillars have the food, has the food that it needs um, to metamorphosize into the adult stage. And the tulip tree is known for these beautiful tulip shaped yellow flowers. Um, so another point of interest in your landscape. Um, Something else to take note is that when you are visiting some of our, you know, na nature preserves or parks, I encourage you to look up into the canopy. Um, you know, people are often uh, aware that you can have butterflies and, and other pollinators in a flower garden, but, you know, it's really nice to be able to look up into the canopy and see those um, tiger swallowtails flying around um, searching for just the right leaf for um, them to lay their eggs on. Um, the tiger swallowtail can also, um, the caterpillar can also eat the leaves of black cherry and you certainly can't go wrong with a cherry tree and it's native. Um, so I know a lot of you are gonna be um, thinking about what kind of pie to make for your um, safe and home-based Thanksgiving meal. Um, my sister just requested my cherry pie recipe um, for my nephew and uh, you know, his grandpa has planted a cherry tree in his yard, and I know um, they, they do love to make cherry pies with that bounty um, the tree produces. But boy, it's a bounty for the tiger swallowtails as well. So I could just go on and on and on, and I'm looking at the time, and I'm thinking about your time, and so I'm going to start to wrap up. Um, and in wrapping up, I wanted to share a uh, project that we're working on at Save the Dunes to create the second installment of our wildly popular, popular Living in the Dunes guide. This first installment identified um, the different invasive species to look out for in your yard and um, how to incorporate native plants instead. 
And this time around, um, we are focused on our pollinators. So everything that I just shared with you about native plants and which ones support which butterflies, et cetera, which, which pollinators are um, in the landscape and, and what to do to support them, that is all going to be contained in this second installment um, available next year. So keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, um, enjoy learning more about pollinators wherever you can. I highly recommend the Xerxes Society. They've got uh, wonderful information. Uh, you can also work together with your garden club or your community to develop a list this winter so you can install a native garden. Um, uh, it may be at the entrance to your community. Um, this list was put together for the entrance of Ogden Dunes, but recall that beautiful um, you know, landscape that Beverly Shore is installed too. So there's lots of options out there, lots of native plants to consider. The Pollinator Partnership is another organization that um, does a great job at putting together guides for you. Um, again, the, the guide that we're working on is specific for our region. So um, hopefully you'll find that helpful in planning your gardens. Um, and when you do that, um, mindfully and purposefully, you're going to support biodiversity. And so there have been some sad notes um, threaded through the presentation, but really I hope to leave you with a sense of joy because at the end of the day, you can help. Um, also just another plug out there for those gardeners that really want to put annuals in the landscape that maybe aren't native. Well, don't worry, these aren't going to spread into our, um, nat our natural areas or nature preserves um, because they're annuals, um, you have to plant them every year. Um, but these uh, flowers bloom throughout the season. So as you have one, one plant finishing um, its bloom time and, and maybe you don't have another flower that's gonna bloom for a couple of weeks, maybe a month or, or so on. Well, if you put annuals in your garden, that kind of fills that gap and the pollinators will have, that are visiting your garden will have lots of food and nectar to, to keep going. And so Earth, once again, um, I could just look at this image and never ever um, find a lack of inspiration. What a marvelous planet we live on. What incredible biodiversity. And you can help. You can help in your garden. You can help by staying involved. Um, you can get outside and give for Giving Tuesday by just simply appreciating the natural world around you. And so that wraps up my formal presentation. Sorry, sometimes I get choked up when I, I talk about this stuff. It, it just matters so much to me. So I apologize if I'm if I'm choking up. Um, but um, I promised Katie that I would share a couple more of my boxes of pollinators. So, you know, I shared um, these beautiful majestic beauties that will come to your garden. Um, stay tuned in a garden near you. <laughs> You'll have these lovely visitors, um, the large butterflies. But once you have an eye for the butterflies, you'll start to notice um, some of the others that are out there in the landscape. Um, so wonderful diversity um, to, you know, to bring home. Um, but in addition to the butterflies, let's not forget the moths. Moths are also pollinators. And look at these gorgeous, sorry, I'm like, I want to see too. <laughs> look at these gorgeous specimens. These are native moths, um, you know, that'll be supported maybe in, in your home garden. Um, but remember, there are all different types of pollinators, not just the butterflies, not just the moths, but also the other insects. Um, this is a luna moth. You guys are probably wondering. That's a luna moth. Uh, you can see a cicada up here, but also there's lots of different um, bees featured, different pollinators. Um, and these are all native in the landscape. So the insect apocalypse is not here. Um, because we're all going to do what we can and um, help to support our biodiversity. 
So I think that about wraps it up, Katie. What do you what do you think? Or I think that that was fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all that information. Thank you for um, sharing extra bug boxes. You know how I love them. Yes. Um, I don't see any questions in uh, in our video, but if you're watching the replay of this, please feel free to continue to post those and we'll kind of check in and answer them as they come in. Um, so I think we're ready to wrap up if that's okay with you. That sounds good to me, Katie. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you again for that presentation. That was wonderful. Um, I'm excited to incorporate some of those tips into my yard for sure next season. Um, don't forget, everyone, this is part of our Giving Tuesday series. Um, so be sure to get involved, get outside and give this Giving Tuesday, which is on December 1st. Um, we have a generous matching sponsor this year, um, Mark J. Mahalo, DDS Family Dentistry. So thank you to them for providing that matching gift. So whatever you donate will be matched 100% up to that $1,000 um, donation that they made. So be sure to to add Save the Dunes to your list of organizations to support this Giving Tuesday. We hope that you will. Um, we have one more presentation uh, as part of the series that will be happening on December 1st. It's all about advocacy, so we're excited for that one. But uh, this was fascinating. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you, Katie. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. Bye, guys. Bye.